Hey guys, Miss Miklos here with our first lecture of the semester. And in today's lecture, we're talking about nth roots and rational exponents. And we know that the word rational means that we can write something as a fraction of integers. So today we're going to be kind of doing some review about radicals. So that's what our roots come from. And we're also going to talk about how to convert those into rational exponents or fractional exponents. So I want to start just by looking and examining at this particular symbol. And often when we see a symbol like this, we call it a square root. But to be more specific, we should call it a radical sign. A square root is a specific type of radical. And what determines what type of radical it is, if it's a square root or a cube root or so forth, would be our index number. So our index number is this number. It, in this case, it's n, but we would see a 3, we would see a 4. Sometimes we will see nothing there. And if we don't see anything, then we know it is an index number of 2. You guys may remember that our index number is what's telling us how big a group needs to be in order for us to take things out. For example, in square roots, we need to look for pairs to take things out. If our index number is 3, I need 3 of a number in order to take it out. Lastly, we call the number inside our radical a radicand. Okay, so this terminology is just important. It's going to come up a few times when we refer to this value. So now we're going to connect that radical to a fractional exponent. So if we have something like the nth root of a, that actually becomes a to the 1 over n power. And where the 1 over n comes from, our numerator, this 1, comes from whatever this exponent is. Our denominator, which is n, comes from the index number. So we know the nth root of a is equal to a to the 1 over n power. So if we had something like the square root of a, we could write this as a to the 1 half power. 1 coming from the exponent. 2 is our index number. Since we don't see anything in our index value here, we know that it has to be a 2. So a square root is the same thing as a 1 half power. Sorry if you guys are hearing weird sounds. My cat is playing in a box. I don't know. He's weird. Anyways, if you're curious what the heck the sound is. Okay, next one. What if we had the cube root of a? This case, it would become a to the one third power because once again, my exponent here is one. My index number is three. If we had something like the fifth root of a cubed, that's going to become a to the 3 fifths power. So this really is just a pattern we need to get used to and as we get used to it, it becomes pretty easy to follow and understand what our numerator is, which is always our exponent, and our denominator, which is always our index number. On the other hand, sometimes we'll have something that is in a rational exponent form and we can change this into radical form. So there's actually two different accurate ways. The first would be to make this the nth root of a to the mth power. The other accurate way would be to make it the nth root of a to the mth power. So that we would be taking this entire quantity to this exponent. And the way that we would choose to do this would really depend on the actual number that our radicand is and what would be the simplest way to go ahead and simplify it. Now, one thing that I want to point out, the reason why fractional exponents can be helpful is because some rules that we know with radicals, I can only multiply radicals together if we have the same index number. And what we will see is that if I happen to have the same radicand and we have different index numbers, it is a good idea to actually write it in exponential form because we know how to deal with exponents. If we're adding radicals, we can only add radicals together if they have the same index number and the same radicand. Okay, and these are kind of two concepts you guys learned back in Algebra 1, but I know that it's been a while, so I just wanted to quickly review those. So 
So let's get started here. Our directions just say simplify, so I'm going to take something like 9 to the 3 halves power. I really don't know how to work with this, so I'm going to convert it into radical form. Since our denominator is 2, I know that this becomes a square root. Since 9 is my base, I know that becomes my index, or I'm sorry, my radicand. And since 3 is in the numerator, that becomes my exponent. Since I have the square root of 9 written and I know that's going to become an integer, I'm actually going to take that whole quantity to the third power because I'd rather work with smaller numbers. I know the square root of 9 is 3, and 3 cubed would become 27. Now, if you chose to cube 9 inside here and then take the square root of it, you would still get 27. So know that either way is correct. It's just that one way might be dealing with smaller numbers, and it might make it a little bit easier to work with. Number two, this time we're dealing with a negative exponent, and you guys may recall from last semester that whenever we have a negative exponent, we need to make it positive by putting it on the other side of our fraction. So once again, I don't really know how to deal with this whole two-fifths nonsense, so I'm going to change it into the fifth root of 32 squared. Now, just kind of a reminder, um, the way that we deal with simplifying radicals, if I did a factor tree, this actually, when we break it down, would become 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2. This 5 tells me that I need a group of 5 numbers in order to take them outside of our radical. So in this case, I actually get 1 over 2 squared, which becomes 1 fourth. And whenever it's telling us to just simplify and it doesn't talk about rounding or using our calculator, this is really a good method. Now our graphing calculator um, actually does some great things as well. If you guys go to math, okay, if you go to the menu that says math, if you choose, I believe it's option number four, it is a cube root. And option 5 actually has an x as our radical. So in your calculator, if you wanted to go ahead and find a fifth root of 32, you would type 5, and then you would find that x root button, and then you would press 32, and it would go ahead and tell you that the answer is 2. So that's a good skill just to know um, that can help us out when we're actually finding these numbers that come out evenly to be integers. So let's practice doing that a little bit more. So number three, we have the cube root of 54. So I'm going to start by doing a factor tree, and the two factors that come to my mind are 9 and 6. Remember, if you did any other two factors, it would be fine. I know 9 is 3 and 3, and 6 is 3 and 2. At this point, these are all prime numbers. We call this a prime factorization. And I know that I'm looking for groups of 3 because my index number is 3. So I notice that I have 3 3, so I'm going to write that out in front. I have stuff left over, so I still need this cube root. And what I have left over is that 2, so my 2 is going to go on the inside. So my answer is 3 cube root 2. Now, I want to stress to you guys, it's really important I write this cube root because a cube root is very different from a square root, and that's a really easy mistake to make. So I just want to caution you guys, take the time, make sure you write the index number correctly. Here's another one where we're simplifying. So it's the fourth root, so this time I know that I need to find groups of four. I know 64 is eight and eight. So I'm gonna break this down to four and two, four and two. So it'd be two times two times two, times 2 times 2 times 2. So I need to look and see, do I have 4 of any number? And I notice I have 4 twos, so that's going to go on the outside. I have stuff left over, so I need a fourth root. And then I have 2 times 2, which is 4. So our answer could be 2 fourth root of 4. And I'm letting you guys know I would be completely fine with this answer. 
Now, if we're checking things in the book, we might sometimes find a different answer, and that could be true if we're taking a multiple choice type test. And um, I wanna let you guys know that in this case, two radical two would also be a correct answer, and here is why. Based on what we just learned, okay, I'm just gonna focus on the four through to four. I can go ahead and write four as two squared. And then I can change that to a rational exponent, so it would become 2 to the 2 fourths power. And I know 2 fourths reduces to 1 half. And anything to the 1 half power is like I'm taking a square root. Okay, so sometimes in the book, if you're checking answers, you might notice that what you get might be completely different from what the book is stating. And often, they'll do something like this to simplify the answer further. I'll let you know, I would accept either of these two answers. They are both totally fine with me. The final concept on this lecture is solving. And um, kind of some things that I just want to point out when we are solving is that whenever I put a radical into our equation, if our index number is even, I need a plus or minus, and here's why. Okay, um, let, let's think of something simple that we've done previously, like x squared equals nine. If I square root both sides, I get x equals plus or minus three, and the reason being is three squared is nine, and negative three squared is also nine. If I have an odd index number, like, if we had x cubed equals 27, what we're gonna learn to do here is I can actually do a cube root of both sides and we'll talk about that in a second. But I would get x equals three. And let's think about this. Three cubed is 27. Negative three cubed is negative 27. So that is not a correct answer. So that's why when our index number here is odd, I do not need plus or minus. When it's even, I do need to put plus or minus in. Okay, back to number five. Kind of a side note here, we're actually only finding the real zeros using this method, and that's totally fine. First thing I need to do is isolate whatever's being taken to a power. So this becomes x to the fourth equals 81. And now I need to get rid of this fourth power. So what we're going to do, we are going to take a fourth root of both sides. And the reason why a fourth root works is because we know that a fourth root is the same thing as taking something to the one-fourth power. And x to the fourth to the one-fourth power is the same thing as x, okay? So I just get x on the left side of my equation if we go through and do our factor tree of 81, we end up getting that there are four threes, so I can take out that group, and there's nothing else left over, so my radical goes away. So my answer here would be x equals plus or minus three. Now you might be thinking to yourselves, well, our degree was four, we should have had four answers, and that's correct, but these are actually the only two real zeros. Our other two would have been imaginary, and we don't really care about them. Last problem here. Um, this sometimes can look tough because it's like, oh shoot, do I need to multiply this out? And the good news is no. What's being taken to a power is already isolated, so I'm just gonna cube root both sides. Since my index number is odd, I do not need plus or minus. Once I cube root x minus one cubed, I just end up with x minus one. And I actually cannot do anything with the cube root of 10 because I don't have any groups of three to take out. So to isolate x, I'm gonna get one all by itself and I get one plus the cube root of 10. So your first um, homework assignment is really going off of this particular lecture where um, it's pretty simple, it's pretty to the point, it's just really making sure we understand this concept of fractional exponents and dealing with roots other than two.